when this session ends. Who has the schedule handy? <laughs> 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 Always begin with the end in mind, right? And don't bother remembering anything if you can look it up later. Apparently we're going straight till 4. We'll probably be able to steal a few minutes, but not much. So I'll plan, I'll plan for an hour and 55 minutes and we'll be worst case two hours. Alright. A warning. A warning for the uh, for the camera in the room. Filming this is going to be awfully boring. It's going to be a lot of there's going to be a lot of people writing code, so that's going to be we'll have, we'll just put an edit with a nice fade out. 25 minutes later, fade in. Uh, thank you so much for your willingness to uh, to come here instead of going to one of those sessions. Um, uh, it's it's been a really fun several days here. Um, and I, I really love being at the end of the program, so uh, this is going to be a lot of fun. How many of you have been to a code retreat before? Awesome! I love that only a couple of hands went up. Um, legacy Code Retreat is essentially a code retreat where we work on legacy code. One of the most, uh, one of the biggest obstacles I've seen to learning and practicing rescuing legacy code is that we always seem to feel so much under pressure to deliver quickly that we never really take the time to do things the way we want to do them. We never really feel like we have permission to learn what we need to learn. And one of the problems with legacy code, the primary difficulty, what makes legacy code expensive, is that everywhere you look, there's another nasty surprise. And we do not know ahead of time how many nasty surprises there are going to be, which means we have no idea how long it's going to take to get anything done. So we never feel like we have permission to simply, it, you know, the, the answer is going to be done when it's going to be done is usually not good enough for most people. And what, with legacy code, there's no bloody choice. It's going to be done when it's going to be done. My goal in uh, doing legacy code retreat is to give people a safe artificial learning environment where they can practice the techniques in an environment where there's no pressure to perform, uh, but there is, let's just say that this code base you're about to deal with is a kitten whose claws are surprisingly sharp. And the idea is to practice the techniques here so that you can see what it's like to use them and then you'll feel more confident using them on, uh, in your daily work. Now, normally, this is a full day community event or a two day private engagement. Just to give you a sense of scope, which means that this is going to be a heavily abbreviated version, but I'm gonna to try to give you a taste of what it's like. Uh, so, come on in. Either open a laptop or sit next to someone who has one. Uh, now, for those of you who don't know Code Retreat, the basic idea behind Code Retreat is to give people an opportunity to practice in, as I said, in an environment where there's no pressure to perform. And the basic format of, of um, Code Retreat is there's a standard problem that we all work on. People work in pairs. They work in 45-minute iterations. In 45 minutes, they work with their pair. They try to solve the problem, but they focus on practicing certain techniques. Normally we frame this in terms of test-driven development, we tell people about the four elements of simple design, and we say, let these be your guide, you have 45 minutes. And the, one, the number one rule of code retreat is, if you solve the problem in 45 minutes, then you've missed the point. The point is not to solve, we know that you can solve the problem of implementing Conway's Game of Life. In fact, if you know J, you can implement it in about 14 characters. Conway's Game of Life is not a difficult problem to solve, and so the idea is to focus on the techniques and not on the problem. Now here we're going to have something similar, except that we're going to give you a code base that is a little bit more interesting than the problem of Conway's Game of Life. And so I'm certainly not expecting you to get from the beginning to the end of, in 45 minutes. The beautiful thing about refactoring is that you never have to stop. Uh, the idea, what makes uh, legacy code retreat a bit different is that instead of doing 45 minutes of work, then throwing all your work away and switching partners. Oh wait, no, that's exactly what you do. <laughs> Code Retreat is based on the idea that for 45 minutes you work on the problem, you focus on technique, at the end of 45 minutes you shake hands with your partner, get reset hard, go on to the next machine. 
And the idea is that by doing this and throwing away your work several times a day, you get to approach the problem a bunch of different ways. With legacy code retreat, we're going to do the same thing, but looking at different specific techniques that help dealing with legacy code. So we're going to have time for two iterations here, and I'm going to make them a little bit shorter uh, just because um, of our time constraints. So that's, that's the basic idea. Your job will be to work for, let me set my timer here. Clock, hello, wake up. It's time for a new phone. All right, so. Uh, in order to make this the authentic legacy code experience, uh, I'd like you to do an iteration where uh, I'd like you to try to make the code better. I hope I'm writing this big enough that everyone in the back can read it. GitHub.com slash jbrain slash trivia. Try to make the code better. Good luck. You have 40 minutes. Because remember, in a legacy situation, nobody knows what the program does. Nobody knows what make it better means. Nobody knows how to run anything. That's normal. If you do not have Git installed, you can still download the code from here as a zip file, unzip it, and run it. You're welcome. I decided not to make it an even more authentic legacy code environment by uh, having you download the code using ClearCase. <laughs> what happened to uh, and then the first iteration would be to download it. <laughs> would be down, would be, how do I configure the VOB again? What? So in there you should find the code for one of about 20 languages. I hope you speak one of them. Oh yeah, that's true. You can use separate. Yes. <laughs> if somehow you don't have a compiler for any language on your machine, Cyber. you could try CyberDojo and see if that'll just paste the code in there and see what happens. I hadn't even thought about that. If we have any problems, I'll just go find John and bring him here. <laughs> Unfortunately, getting it up and running at all is usually part of the legacy environment experience. Alright, good. Now at least I see lots of people puzzlingly looking at code. That's good. Stop! Ooh. Hands up! <laughs> so ordinarily what we would do now is what I like to call the code retreat shuffle which is get reset hard, shake the hand of the person you've been pairing with, and then move. But we're not going to do that just yet. Uh, and that is the normal, that is the normal uh, format of a code retreat, is that after you've done all that really hard work, you immediately throw it away. And part of the reason that we do this, by the way, is not just because it's convenient for our purposes, but is also to help us develop a healthy detachment from our code. Um, this is the most zen I'm going to get during my time here. Uh, you are not your code, you are not your code, you are not your code. Uh, one, and I'm quite serious about this, one force that leads to legacy code is a feeling of identifying oneself in one's code. Why else do you think code is commented out but not deleted? Right? You have version control, don't you? Yeah. Well then, why did you just delete it? Well, I might need it someday. You have version control, don't you? Yeah. You have a backup system, don't you? Yeah. 
So there's a whole host of things that I want to talk about, and we don't have a lot of time, so I'm going to do this a little bit rapid fire. In exchange for doing that, I will let you know that I am making a list of some references that I think you might find useful later, and I promise to compile these by the weekend and make them available to you. So in the worst case, uh, if you want to just try to stare at me rather than jot everything down, I think you'll probably find that a little bit easier. And as long as you uh, follow the Agile OTV Twitter hashtag, you'll, uh, you'll be able to get a list of references. Uh, so one uh, fun thing that I like to do is to keep track of when I hear things during this first session especially. Uh, so the seven minute mark was the first time I heard somebody go, screw that. <laughs> uh, the 14 minute mark was the first time I heard someone say exasperatedly, what's it doing? At 16 minutes, I heard somebody say, I wouldn't feel comfortable, and then this unsafe thing that their pair partner intended to do next. At the 26 minute mark, I heard someone say, well, we've got Visual Studio now. Uh, and it still doesn't work. It still doesn't work. At 32 minutes, I heard, it's legacy, it's used, it must be right. This is actually... <laughs> This seriously is one of the challenges that we have in working in legacy code, and that is we get to play the, you know, the, uh, the game show that everybody loves to play. There's the home game version too, which is mistake or quirk. We don't know whether something odd that code does is a mistake or a quirk. Uh, one of the really difficulties with legacy code is that we don't know which problems we're allowed to fix. And in fact, we might really be in a situation we are, where we're expressly not allowed to fix things because there are 400 paying customers who all have installed the workaround to work around the bug. And if we fix the bug, we kill their workaround. And so one of the things, that one of the basic principles that I use um, is to always assume that the code should continue to do what it's doing now, even when that's inconvenient. Uh, but then that gives me something to add to my inbox, which is go on an archaeological dig and find out whether this is in fact what it's supposed to do or not. That's not always easy. But it's an aspect of kind of the fundamental notion behind working with legacy code, and that is that uh, job number one in working with legacy code is to maximize safety. Absolutely every micro technique, every tiny step that you take when you're working with legacy code, has to have as its number one, number two, and number three priorities, safety. You have to assume that everywhere you go, you're stepping on the combination of a landmine and a trigger for a nuclear reactor. That's what legacy code really means. And in fact, when we, when we do a full day legacy code retreat or a training class, uh, invariably somebody asks me, how afraid should I be of this code? And my answer is always, as afraid as you can be. And one of the sessions that we do is, in fact, based on uh, improve the code without changing any of the existing code. And that usually gets a whole bunch of people going, well, how the hell do you do that? And then after a few minutes, they kind of get the idea of how they can get started. Uh, and the, the 34th minute was the first moment that I heard somebody start to tell a legacy code war story. <laughs> it's one of the coping mechanisms we have for diving deep into this terrible stuff. Is you say, oh man, I remember five years ago I had to do something similar to this stupid thing we're about to do. And it's, a, it's actually, I find, a very healthy thing that helps me kind of get through, you know, walking, uh, wading hit deep in this crap. Uh, the, the 38th minute, I heard someone say, I did something. I'm not sure what it was. Usually this happens when we're struggling to write the first test, and we finally get to the point where an assertion seems to pass, and so we have a passing test, but we have no idea what it signifies. And then right at the end, I heard, I don't know what this piece of code does, but probably followed by, I'm gonna go change it anyway. Uh, maybe it's not the best thing in terms of safety, but I understand the impulse. Uh, somebody asked, are we expected, right, we, are we expected to write tests? And my answer was, your job is to improve the code. Do whatever makes you feel comfortable to improve the code. Often if we get stuck immediately thinking that we need to write tests, then we get stuck in the chicken egg problem. I need to write tests in order to be able to refactor this code, but I need to be able to refactor this code in order to be able to write the first test. So that pushes you in one of two directions. Either 
I uh, have to go bigger and bigger and bigger and at least get some tests that help me get my foot in the door to start refactoring. Or I find the safest refactoring I could reasonably do on the tightrope without a net. Do it and hope that it works. Right? I'm not orthodox, but it can't hurt. Uh, and of course, as with any as with any dichotomy, the natural question is which is better than the other, and the answer is always neither. You should learn to do both. So, in one direction, we have a technique that I learned long ago in my time at IBM called Golden Master. Golden Master is a really good testing technique for code that you're not allowed yet to change or code that you don't feel comfortable yet changing. The basic idea, it's also good, by the way, uh, for checking things that are difficult to specify with code, like this image looks the same as it looked before. Well, you can do a binary you know, comparison, but that might be a little bit too strict. You might actually need someone to look at it and say, yes, that's good enough for now. The golden master technique consists of being able to run the test in two modes record and check. Record is just record the output in some format. Check is compare the current run against the last known golden master, the last known correct version. And as long as they are similar enough, the test passes. If they differ, it might be okay, but it means someone needs to intervene, take a look at the golden master and see whether the golden master needs to change. Or in fact, it is a test failure. Now you have the technique, you have the tools that you need to use Golden Master here. What's going to help you write Golden Ma a Golden Master for this game? The initial menu. The text output. So here's a stupid technique. Now you could just fix the random seed, spit out one game, use put that in a text file, and hope that's good enough. One of the things that I did was in fact write a little loop in that game runner that ran the game runner 10,000 times with 10,000 different seeds, put those text files in a directory. And then the test run would put the output in the directory and then I would just do a basic diff on the directories. Now, we're used to refactoring when we have confidence that we can change the code correctly. But in legacy code, we don't often have confidence that we've changed the code correctly. What's the best, what's the next best thing? An obvious big red signal that we got it wrong. And that's what Golden Master gives you, is it doesn't give you confidence that you've changed the code correctly, but it gives you a big red flashing light in case you changed it incorrectly. And again, when we're working in code where we really don't know what it's supposed to do, this is often the best we can hope for. And so the Golden Master technique is really helpful. Now working in Java, the cool thing is it's only a one line of code change to put the seed in the random number generator. Somebody actually made this even better by doing it in a shell script. So they didn't even have to change the code at all, which I thought was kind of brilliant. And of course that shell script worked with most versions of the code. Um, let's see, yes. Often we're also, when we work with legacy code, we're also working in a legacy environment. That it's not just that the code is in bad shape, but so are the configuration files, the file system, the network setup, the, uh, the overall machine architecture, everything. There could be lots of problems. You know that this happens because you're working in some code and then some very weird stuff happens that you can't explain. You get the local resident expert involved and that person says, oh yeah, you forgot to copy this file from there to there, didn't you? That's an example of a legacy environment problem. All the more reason why we need to focus on safety. Um, now, one of the ways to combat the legacy environment problem is to pay much more attention to even making sure that your environment is correct before you try to run a test on a code. So, Ron Jeffries introduced me to the concept of a hookup test. A hookup test is the first test he writes in any programming session. And it's literally just Assert true false. Run the test and watch it fail. Now, how the hell is that useful? Well, it's useful to make sure that you're at least writing the, you're at least running the correct set of tests. Uh, have you ever been in a situation where you were knee deep in a project and you started doing some work and then you get green, 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 and then realize, oh shit, I'm running the wrong tests. I have. And it's so much easier to do. 
when you're working in one of these legacy environments. That's not a clean, nice, simple, check everything out, run it everything, self-contained kind of environment. This is a problem that is going to get worse over the next few years as we all get used to containerization and expect everything to be this nice, clean, antiseptic, immutable environment, and then suddenly we're put in some stuff that was written five years ago, and it's none of that. I have, a, I have the feeling that one of the consequences of the containerization of everything is that 90% of good programmers are going to forget how to deal with code before you would just spin up a new virtual machine and everything was immutable. So in a legacy environment, it's all the more important to make sure before you even touch any of the code to make sure that the assumptions you're making about the environment are correct, that you're running the right tests, that you're running them in the right environment with the right command line switches, with the right environment variables, and all that kind of crap. Uh, let's see, don't assume new works. If you're in a language in which you instantiate objects, don't assume new works on the object that you're about to test. That test that you write, you know, check to make sure my constructor works, which is a ridiculous test to write when you're test driving new code, is an absolutely essential test to write when you're working with legacy code, because I'll bet you that legacy code does not follow the principle of don't let constructors do anything interesting. We all know not to let constructors do anything interesting, but they don't know that. Or you didn't know that five years ago when you wrote this crappy code. Uh, one last thing, I think. Uh, yes. A thing that I have to call the improve understand loop. And this is maybe one of the most common things that we go through when we're working in legacy code. Um, you're probably going to have the impulse to try to understand what's going on as soon as you start looking at your code. You need to resist this impulse, because it's all very unlikely that you're going to understand very much of what's going on. Don't let your lack of understanding get in the way of your ability to improve the code. I'm going to say that again because that sounds awfully counterintuitive. Don't let your lack of understanding of what the code is doing inhibit your ability to improve the code. It, you need probably to start making some small improvements, removing some duplication, moving some stuff around, in order to get a handle on what's going in this small part of the code. And then the names start to make sense. Or you improve, the, you start to understand the code, then you rename some things. That helps you see some new structures that you can introduce. You still don't know what the code does yet, but you know it's duplicated, so you remove it, which tells you to go back. Now I, there's more that I can understand, and you go through this loop. Don't try to understand too much at the beginning. Working with legacy <laughs> code involves a certain amount of trying to improve the structure before you really understand what any of it does. That's where the mechanics of refactoring become important. Where you need to have confidence in your ability to change code without changing the behavior. And so if you have not read the book Refactoring, and I can't imagine that anyone in this day and age could have possibly been a professional programmer for more than 10 minutes without reading the book Refactoring, as the damn thing is 15 years old now, uh, that that book is that you should you should be able to dream pages from that book by now. And if you can't, then add that to your list. Um, I would like to find out just very quickly. I was one question I always like to ask after the first session, which is where did you start? So where did you start? Which section of the code did you start trying to improve once you finally got rolling? Usually the answer is which function did you try to improve? Where did you guys start? We started, to be honest, we started more with our approach of trying to get our heads around what was going on, and then working out what was the best strategy to start. There is some what was the first bit of what was the first bit of code that you decided to start fixing or improving? Was it a particular function? Was it a constructor? What? Well, we didn't start improving. There was, there was no C in JavaScript, so we didn't get to. You didn't get to that yeah. one. Okay, yeah, so you got what we wanted to do, and we're in the process of starting. Of figuring out how to do it. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so didn't get there. Yeah. Okay. Sorry? They started with the categories. Roll. Roll. Um, which one? Add player or add player? Add player. Same? Same? Add player? The only change we made was clean format to get consistent style. Ah, okay. Consistent style, right? Current category. Ca uh, current category? Creation of personal objects. Oh, so you just immediately said, I'm going to create an abstraction that wasn't there before, okay? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, 
Right, so where was that into? So the, oh yeah, you started by, uh, and was it the output or the stream of roles that you put in you? Okay, so you, you started by trying to collect the player stuff together. Okay. Role. Role. Add players. Add player. We got sucked into, we spotted a magic number and got sucked into fixing it and realized we should be writing tests for players and stuff. Which magic number did you find? Number six. Number six. Where did you find number six? Sorry? In the initialization. Oh, in the uh, in the, the dimensions of the arrays. Yes. Say Right. Yeah. How many people found the typo in the word correct? Okay. That was great. Also did that as well. That should have been copied and pasted, and yet somehow it was copied and pasted incorrectly. Great. Uh, has, how many people have come across the bug in adding the sixth player? Okay, that's something for you to be aware of. So for those of you, for those of you who are working on add player in this next uh, session, if you want to keep working there, then uh, do get to the point where you try to add the sixth player, and you should find a you should find a nice, delightful bug that will make you. What's the What's the old line that the only the only useful metric in uh, working with legacy code is um, the number of what the fucks per minute. <laughs> That'll be the one that you're definitely gonna, you're going to run into. Um, oh, that actually reminds me of an article that I had in the list, so let me do that real quick. So, uh, I threw you in the deep end rather intentionally. Uh, and I gave you no real advice or guidance because that is kind of what legacy code is like and I find that it's a fun way to start the day. Uh, I'm going to switch gears now and I'm going to be ultra prescriptive. And I'm going to give you, so what we typically do in a legacy code retreat is the first session, the first uh, iteration is what you just did. Uh, knowing that uh, I'm going to learn a little bit about you, uh, about 20% of you are going to struggle getting the environment up and running to be able to write and run code at all. Um, and uh, but really, the best case scenario is you'll write two or three tests, or you'll be able to change five or six lines of code. Um, the fir essentially, the first iteration is there to be thrown away. Now that everybody's up and running, then I start providing some specific legacy code techniques like subclass tests, like replace inheritance with delegation, that we then practice one by one. Then, near the end of the day, I come to the killer technique, what I think is the killer legacy code technique. Um, for both senses of killer, it will kill the code and it will kill you. Um, this, this exercise is the closest you're going to get to the kind of good pain you get when you go to the gym. Right? This is the tearing down muscle fibers to build it up kind of pain that I'm going to ask you to do next. One of the most um, difficult uh, aspects of legacy code is temporal coupling. Is that the statements in the program need to go in a specific sequence in order for the program to work. The pragmatic programmers call this programming by coincidence or programming by accident. That's where you sort of move lines of code around and you don't know why it works this way but not that way, but then you just sort of leave it that way and go. Uh, a lot of legacy code is like that. And that comes down to temporal coupling. How many people here have read or watched the MIT lecture videos for the structure and, and interpretation of computer programming? Okay. For those of you who don't want to read a somewhat whimsical uh, textbook, I recommend you go to YouTube and look up SICP and watch the MIT videos. They're actually pretty good. Uh, they're from the 80s, so the technology is really uh, quite interesting to see. The projector is very cool. Um, the reason I bring it up is because when I watched these uh, videos, something struck me uh, that it really slapped me in the face and fell out of my chair. When they come to the part where they say that um, as soon as you can store values in variables and read them again later, you've broken the essential model of computing. <laughs> the, the mere fact that we actually store values in a box and some other part of the code goes to that box and reads those values at some later point literally breaks our ability to reason about code. And temporal coupling is a, is a symptom of that. 
the, what it does is it creates a dividing line where everything that happens before the line can happen in any order, and everything that happens after the line can happen in any order, but all the stuff up here has to happen before all the stuff down there. And this is one of the biggest enemies to refactoring. It makes it not only hard to rearrange the statements within a function, but it also makes it difficult to split the function apart, and then to move functions closer to where they should be, to the correct module, to the correct uh, object, depending on what language you're working with. This technique roots out temporal coupling with a relentlessness that will make you want to shoot yourself or that you will really appreciate. And it's very simple. Pick a function. I'm going to suggest the role function, but if you really don't like that one, you can pick another one. Pick a function and essentially refactor it so that it has absolutely no, uh, it doesn't touch the state of its object at all. It takes all its inputs through parameters, it returns all its outputs through the return value. If you happen to be working in a language where you can return multiple return values, that'll be helpful. Uh, if not, you'll have to create a little crappy object and you'll have to pack all the stuff in and then the caller will have to unpack it all and stuff it in the right place. This does a better job than any other single technique in finding temporal coupling problems and telling you exactly <coughs> where to break things apart. So that's all you need to do for the next 40 minutes is pick a function, as I said, I recommend roll, and refactor it so that it does not take any uh, all, all, so that it's essentially a pure function. It's a, it's a referentially transparent function. It has no, it does not touch the state of the object at all. And do it carefully. So for example, if it reads a field, then it's not allowed to read the field. The way that I usually do it is I will take all the code, I'll do a trivial extract method. I'll take all the code and extract it to a new method. And then if this guy is reading a field called x, then it'll call this function passing in this dot x, and this guy won't know that x was a field. Is that a little bit clearer? Mm -hmm. Well, we'll see how it goes. Good luck. Go. <laughs> and you want to throw away your refactorings first? Now is a good time to do it. No choice. No well, transitive, transitive closure shouldn't do that either. So as I said, the easy, usually the way that I think about it is I clone the functions, and then the old version is the one that reads the right state, but it calls the new version, which doesn't do anything, it just sees inputs and outputs. Yes, and that at least tells you how much you need to do. So if you're working in a language with a static keyword, that could be helpful. You were trying to collect the person related stuff from the person watch. Yeah, I took my time. Right. Yeah, because the increment, not necessarily the increment, actually, I'll write that down to discuss that sure. The incremental rewrite on that approach is one that I like to use a lot, where instead I just sort of say, okay, if it happens to be code where I, I neither get a handle on what it's doing, or if you happen to have a specification for it, then I feel pretty comfortable. So I just prefer uh, rewriting a small part of it. So that it's, you know, you know perhaps test drive a oh, replacement for some small yeah, part of it, and then we have traffic that was test around the object. Right. Right. Um, so yeah, so if I saw that, hey, I, I just, let me just collect all the person stuff together, and then I'll go from there. I can test drive whatever little behavior my person needs, and then go figure out how to make the old code use my stuff, and slowly rewrite bits of it. And I'll talk about that, actually, make a note for that. It is a big cluster. Uh, 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 uh,
environments in which people feel comfortable making mistakes so that I can then embarrass them afterwards. Um, but also because when you see somebody else's approach to it, then you can compare what you did to what they did, and you can decide to take the parts of what they did that you like and throw away the parts of what they did that you don't like. The way, the basic mechanics of how to perform this refactoring essentially go like this. Take the entire function, do the trivial extract method. So in this case, now you have role, which calls do role and it passes that one parameter in, and otherwise, nothing is different. You can now run all your golden master tests, or you can do your manual inspection, nothing should have changed. By the way, whenever I work in legacy code, my favorite thing to say after I make a change is, that shouldn't have changed anything. That shouldn't have changed anything. That shouldn't have changed anything. Changed anything. That's proper refactoring. Now, inside do role, my goal is to take all the references to the fields and have them flow back into the role method. Some of you, caught on the trick that, well, if I mark that method as static, or if I move it into a different namespace, then the compiler will force me to fix everything. That's an awfully unsafe way to do things. <laughs> I might do that to get a sense of the scope of the job, right? If I see 37 red squiggly lines, then I know I'm going to have about an hour and a half work to do. I'll go grab a coffee now, right? But if I see three squiggly lines, oh, that's only going to take four minutes. I'll be fine. So now I take that static keyword or const back out, and what I have now is role calling do role. And I look in the code, okay, where's the first place I'm reading a field? Because reading a field is easier, right? I'm reading that. So I'm reading a field called A. So the simplest thing to do is go back to my role function and pass in A to do role and then add a parameter for A. Make sure everything still works. Why will everything still work? Well, either the name of the parameter doesn't shadow the name of the field, in which case my do role is still using the field and I haven't actually changed anything, right? I've just passed in a new parameter and ignored it. Or the names happen to match, in which case I'm now passing in the same value from the outside. It should still work. Run the tests, make sure they all still work. If I have to now, I can go and I can say, well, in all the places where I'm reading that field, let me replace it with that new function's formal parameter. And after every single change, run the tests, nothing should have changed. Run the tests, nothing should have changed. By the way, when I do this, I might not actually have real tests, but it's whatever I do to make myself, give myself that, check the signal that tells me we got it obviously wrong. And then when that's done, I go to the next one. Now if the next one happens to be an output, uh, a, write, uh, a field that I'm writing to, then, instead of turning that into an input, I turn that into a return value, and then I go back into the role, and I say, do role, store the variable, store the return value, and now write that to the field. So this dot, is player getting out of penalty box, equals do role. And then over here now, do role will return that is getting out of penalty box. Or if you're working in C++, you get to decide, do I want to make it an output variable, or a return value? Same if you're working, I guess, in C-sharp. Do I want to make it an out variable, or do I want to make a return value? In Java, we don't have a choice. Got to be a return value. Should I make the struct for the return values now, because I know there's going to be more than one? Actions. But the idea for me is to go one by one, to take each field reference and move it up the call stack. And then what I've got left behind is code that makes no reference to any of the fields. Doesn't read any fields, doesn't write to any fields. What's the consequence of this? Well, there's a few. When you tried to write tests, if you tried to write tests for role, it probably annoyed you that you had to add players before you could call role. That's what I call an irrelevant detail. Whenever your tests have irrelevant details, that's bad news for you. The cool thing about having the pure function is that writing tests for that, while tedious, 
is easy. Because all I have to do is provide all the inputs and check all the outputs. Another consequence of that is that it's easy to spot cohesion problems. Look at the parameter list. I have eight parameters. Signal one, hmm, too many responsibilities in one place. Well, duh, we knew that anyway. But in particular, these five parameters seem to belong together, but separate from these three. There's a cohesion problem. You might notice that because the names are similar. You might notice that because these five in a row keep changing, whereas the other three is kind of unpredictable. Or these five in a row haven't changed at the same time, however you want to look at it. This is where, if you're working in a static language, static typing language like Java or C Sharp and have good refactoring tools, you just introduce parameter object on those five things, and you get a nice struct with those five things as fields, and now you can pass it in as one thing and return it as one thing. So, uh, extract pure function, introduce parameter object, introduce parameter object, boom! I've taken something that was horrible and created space to pull things apart. And now I can find this part of the code base only deals with the new parameter object. That should now become a function on that new parameter object. Another thing that it helps me figure out is if I have a pure function that is returning something that is also an input parameter, that's a signal of a potential problem. That's command query separation violation, which might or might not be a problem. But what it almost always points to is that Somewhere inside the function, I'm reading from, I'm writing to something and then reading to, reading from it later. And that's always a bad idea because when I write to a variable here and then read from it there, this statement has to come before that statement. Now there's only one way I know of in programming to make it very, 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 very clear that this statement has to come before that statement. And that is for this statement to be a function that returns the value and this to be a function that accepts that value. And then I call this and use pass the value in and call the other. That's called functional programming, I'm told. So, I can actually look at these long pure functions and draw the line where the temporal coupling fits in. And I can say, well, everything above this line has to happen before everything below this line. Well, then that makes it pretty clear that at a minimum I'm going to pull that into two functions. And there might be a bunch of these little lines if the function's a thousand lines long. So it makes it very clear how to chunk things up. So even if you don't have good names telling you this bit belongs on its own and this bit belongs on its own, just by introducing this pure function you can get that same benefit. So talking about uh, cohesion problems, parameter object, main query separation. Uh, yes. How many people here know the four elements of simple design? Also known as Kent Beck's rules of simple design. Oh, good. So then that'll be part of your reading. These four elements of simple design are these rules that we've had beaten into us for well over a decade now that I teach to every programmer I come in contact with and that are these magical guiding principles that are like fairies going to jump around your code and make it better. And yet, whenever people practice test-driven development, especially if they're novices, they seem to not feel particularly beholden to these magical rules that I've taught them that will save their lives and make them beautiful and successful. They say, well, I don't need to worry about those silly principles. Why do I have to learn all this law of Demeter crap and, and, uh, and all that kind of nonsense? Well, let me tell you, when you start trying to refactor legacy code, you see what all those violations of those silly principles look like in blood. And with any luck, what I hope will happen is that you'll gain a more, appreci more of an appreciation for how those principles can help. This introducing a pure function um, technique makes those problems smack you right in the head. It's meant to be painful. If you felt like you were just, if you wanted to throw the computer across the room three or four times in the middle of doing that, or if you fell asleep while you were doing it, either, either reaction is normal. That's good. That's trying to really hammer home why these principles are important. Because what's in that code, that code, by the way, was written by Chet Hendrickson. Any XP people know the old story called uh, of why we say it's Chet's fault, right? Whenever we're not sure whom to blame, we just say, that's Chet's fault, let's move on. That's from an old story of when his team was yelling at each other because something went wrong. 
and he watched them yell at each other for five or six minutes, and then he finally wrote, it's my fault, on an index card, slammed it in the table, and said, can we please move on now? So whenever people get into blaming each other, we just say, look, it's Chet's fault, let's move on. Chet was the one who wrote this code. Chet, please channel your inner, your inner COBOL programmer and write a version of this, will you? And so he went to the corner and he did. You can hear him laughing, it's fantastic. Uh, so he's a guy who knows these principles very well and tried to find every creative way he could to break them. And that's the code you have now. The fact that he made code that was plausibly bad just shows what a master programmer Chet Henderson. We can all write bad code, but plausibly bad code is really hard to write. Anyway, that's what these, the, every time you work on legacy code, you'll see another violation of single responsibility, another violation of open close, another violation of duplicate, or another bit of duplicate code, another violation of choosing a, of, uh, choosing a good name. I hope more than anything else, if you look out for when these design principles are violated in the legacy code you're working on, the more you do that, the more I hope you will feel beholden to these <laughs> principles and will pay more attention to them and treat them with more reverence and diligence when you test drive new stuff. Because if you don't, then you're just going to be writing more legacy code for yourself. Ron Jeffries tells the story of Mike Hill who called him up at 3 o'clock in the morning crying because of a gig he was on. And when Ron asked him what the problem is, all Mike could get out was, they just keep writing more legacy code. <laughs> the metaphor I like to use is this one. You don't want to be the programmer who's shitting faster than everybody else can shovel. <laughs> the last little bit thing that I want to point out about safety is that the number one thing, the number one reason, uh, or let me actually, we'll go with the riddle version. Why are there brakes on a car? Oh, so this crashing is a really bad idea. Right. A few of you know the riddle, so you yelled it out straight away, or at least have very good cognitive skills. Most people will say, so that I can stop the car. No. If I'm going two miles an hour, I can just drive into the nearest five-year-old and the car will stop. The reason there are brakes on a car is to be able to go fast. And then be able to stop. Well, that's what version control is about. Version control is pointless unless you have an obvious way to roll back get reset hard. Backups are pointless unless restore is easy, which is why I own a Mac instead of a PC. Because when my internal hard drive, when I used to have one, when my internal hard drive died, I went shit, and then I rebooted, plugged into my USB drive, and or plugged in my USB drive, rebooted, and kept working. Backup is pointless if recovery isn't easy. Version control is pointless if rollback isn't easy. Refactoring legacy code especially is pointless if rollback isn't easy. So before you even get started, make sure you know how to roll back because otherwise you'll go down that rabbit hole and it'll be 20 minutes later and you won't remember what the hell you're doing. Because I was doing something, I don't know what it was. Get reset hard, go back to the last time everything works, grab a coffee, try again. This is again about maximizing safety work in the legacy code. All right. So don't worry, I have the references here. The last thing I'd like to say uh, before I say thank you for participating is uh, you've got a chaotic taste of legacy code retreat. I hope you enjoyed the chaos. Most programmers do. They're, they're pretty used to it. Uh, I usually do legacy code retreat as a one-day community event or as a two-day training, a private training course. When I do the training, by the way, it goes like this. On day one, you learn the techniques by messing around with my code. And on day two, you try to do it on your code. <laughs> so uh, if you are interested in running a legacy code retreat, my suggestion would be to find the nearest code retreat, attend it once, and you know 80% of what you need to know. This is the code base I always use for legacy code retreat. So if you want to try to get some friends together, your local meetup group, your local programmers user group, or even within your company, all you need to know is, here's your code, 45 minutes, uh, 45 minutes uh, sessions, pair, and at the end of the session, throw your changes away and try again. And try to try any legacy code repair, refactoring technique, practice, practice, practice. If you'd like something a little bit more guided that includes more, um, that includes more training, then, uh, jbrains.ca, 
Ask me a question and we'll figure out when I can be at a company near you. Uh, that didn't leave you much time to get to the panel, if you'd like to. Uh, so thank you very much for your time and attention and participation. And uh, get out of here. Anyone who'd like to ask...